All right, I'll, let's do I'll make it. some introductory remarks. Um, and then, you know, so people won't miss too much. How's that? That's so perfect. I'm we'd like to... everybody to mute if you're not, at least in this beginning portion. Uh, what I'm, what we envision is um, a conversation of sorts between Forrest and myself. I'm going to let him do most of the speaking. I'm honored and humbled to have him here, Forrest Schomer. He's truly one of my um, teachers and elders, I feel like, in the seed movement. He was already up and running and doing things I only dreamed of when I first stumbled on the idea of uh, that seed saving was so important. Um, I really believe that um, what the world needs today are more abundant lives. <laughs> seed foundations, which were, was basically a bioregional uh, grassroots organization to uh, grow, save, and share seeds. And um, it was just 30 to 40 years ahead of its time as far as, you know, um, being here today. And so uh, I learned a lot from that experience and in some ways have tried to model some of what we're doing at Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance um, around that. And so I know a lot of people have not even heard of the Abundant Life Seed Foundation now, but in my day it was big. And in fact, it predated, if I'm um, correct, Forrest, uh, the Seed Savers Exchange. It did. It did, which is quite a statement because most of us think that um, so much of the, as I call it, the seed diversity movement um, started with the Seed Savers Exchange. And so um, I'm hoping that we'll get in some stories. And I think, and you've told me, you've got some uh, names of some of the inspiring characters that uh, you've met along the way. Almost true. Almost true. <laughs> and so I think, I, I think we'll get started. And so the number one question I had tonight um, was why? Why in 1973 did you start getting involved professionally in seeds on this level? Well, I'll go back a little bit earlier uh, because, you know, the seed grows out of something. It doesn't just appear. So, you know, how did I get to the germination point in my own development? And um, among people that I often gather with, especially Native people, but uh, also other traditions, they like to recite their lineage when they start speaking to let you know that whole continuous line of ancestors and antecedents who are bringing you up to the point where you can then represent that line of thought or development. So I'm gonna go back a few years earlier and I uh, see that my dear friend, Jean, Jean Fargo has joined us and uh, we were on a call early this morning. Uh, it was the uh, basically the 50 year reunion of our household in Berkeley, uh, a little bit past 50, but close. And uh, while, while we were living in um, Berkeley and sharing a house with a bunch of under, other wonderful people who all got together on uh, Zoom this morning, um, I was beginning to get interested in gardening. At the time, I was a graduate student in urban planning. So, you know, how, what's the connection between urban planning and gardening? It's this simple. I, I grew up in Chicago and Chicago's civic motto is herbs in horto, meaning city in a garden. Herbs, U-R-B, like urban. So I kind of came along with this idea that a city, Chicago was designed by uh, Burnham, uh, who did so many other urban park scapes and, and uh, boulevard systems and so forth. Uh, so when I got to Berkeley, um, no sooner did I start my graduate studies than the People's Park, uh, shall we say, incident or historical event broke out about three blocks off campus. People's Park is still, still kicking in Berkeley. Uh, and what happened there was there was a a lot that was scheduled for redevelopment and had been bulldozed and then left for a very long time by the university. Uh, but it had some nice trees on it and uh, a bunch of parked cars that were randomly strewn around. So the uh, community began to say, why don't we upgrade it and make a place where we can gather and make it beautiful and 
And with no further ado, uh, things like rolling out sod to create instant lawns and, you know, potted flowers appeared mm -hmm. and music started to happen. And there were dinners where we have like a 50 gallon drum of stew going and people would just come up and get ladled out their portion. And the community spirit was, was fantastic. Well, after about six weeks, uh, then Governor Ronald Reagan called in the National Guard and said, you can't use this land. Threw a fence around it. The next day, there was a big riot. Uh, somebody got killed. Uh, then there were um, soldiers on the street for about two weeks. Then there was a march. And then a school let out, and everybody disappeared. So then it's kind of with many others, like, what do we do now? We don't have our park. Uh, there's not much going on here. At that point, um, an incredible garden master named Lucy Hupp appeared. She was at that time 64 years old and uh, um, a very peaceful Quaker soul who lived on the other side of the Berkeley Hills. And she was a garden writer for a local paper. She would come over once a week and fill her car up with people that she had tagged as probable gardeners. Uh, take us over to her place, which is a one acre homestead, and just show us all the herbs and flowers and the different things you could do with them. And of course she had fruit trees tucked in. It was sort of like a permaculture site long before the word was coined. Uh, and so I learned so much from her and in about the second month, seeds started to ripen. And so she initiated me into seed saving at that point, which was about the end of July, 1969. So you could say that seed was planted. And then about two years later, I had relocated to Seattle and I gave my first garden workshop and uh, seeds were beginning to ripen in that garden. Things like sunflowers and pole beans and so forth planted some months earlier. So then uh, I was able to make the connection for people. Uh, see, this used to be an urban waste place. We improved the soil, we grew these plants and now they're making seeds. All the dots are connected. And then uh, at the very end, um, a V formation of geese flew low over us. And I thought, that's a sign. Ever since then, I've been watching for those geese flights. I had one just last week while I was out on our local prairie. Same thing. You know, you do the discourse and then the geese come and honk. Like, that was good. <laughs> uh, so then um, next thing that happened was I became involved in a natural food store, the very first sort of independent natural food store in Seattle. And after about four days, the person in charge said, I can't deal with this. So then I stepped into the um, uh, role of the uh, manager. And uh, as soon as the next season came around, I thought it would be great if we could help people grow their own food. They don't really need to come and buy produce from us. They could just grow their own food. It was very, very simple understanding, but uh, pretty accurate. Uh, so I found out how to get bulk, open pollinated, untreated seeds from the seed industry. Uh, there were a lot more options back then, uh, a lot less hybrids, no genetic modification, and not that much uh, mercaptan and other poisons on the seeds. And then I got some envelopes and, and filled the envelopes and we sold the seed packets for eight cents each. So that was in 1972, and that was called the Growing Family Seeds because the store was the Growing Family Natural Foods. Uh, and then I did that the next year, and then this whole inner development started where I began to see a garden center in my mind's eye, uh, and I made a kind of a mandala of what the center would be based on. Uh, in other words, there's an educational aspect, there was a celebratory aspect, there was um, resources and so forth. And then I thought, okay, I'm gonna make a garden center out of this plan. Uh, the only thing that went wrong with it was that I could not find a location to open in uh, urban Seattle. And the other part was that I didn't have any money. <laughs> so um, I scraped up what little I had, got a couple of loans, and then I thought, I'll just do the seeds because I've already done that. I understand how to go about that. That was in 1974. And within that season, I had um, started selling the seeds off of racks in other stores besides ours. And I had about eight uh, wholesale customers and, a, and maybe 500 mail order customers. 
you may have seen that one that the first catalog was actually like a sunflower. So it was a origami folded seed list. And as you opened it up, each petal would open and reveal more, you know, like herbs or flowers or whatever. It was all done in calligraphy and I still have a copy of that. I'm missing, I think 1982, if anybody ever sees one, I'm still looking for that. Uh, so that's how the first year went. And then it just, just grew um, and uh, eventually cutting forward a few years and relocating from Seattle to Fort Townsend where I am now. Uh, we got to a point where we were printing 40,000 catalogs, had sales racks in 175 stores in 25 states. And it was a pretty bustling thing. Plus, we had our production gardens going. Um, and uh, at that point, I would say it had succeeded. Uh, and then shortly after that, there was what often happens in a nonprofit. There was a little crisis between board members. And uh, that's just kind of when you have to shed your skin and turn into a, a butterfly. You know, so that, that's when I made the jump to my current business, Inside Passage, which is all natives. Uh, so I did the vegetable thing for about 20 years and then moved on to what I see as a greater mission, which is trying to regenerate native plant material all over the landscape, uh, gardens and beyond, uh, places where vegetables don't grow, for example. So that, that's an, in a nutshell. Now you can home in on the details you're interested in. Wow, so it started in Berkeley. <laughs> yeah. How many of these stories started? You know, that explosion of consciousness that happened in the 60s, in the 70s. Um, you know, we were, when I met you, I th first I think was 1985 at the Missouri uh, Botanical Gardens, where I think it was the National Gardening Association and the Missouri Botanical Gardens brought together over a hundred small, what I'll call small seed people, people that were doing somewhat the same thing, focusing more on adapted open pollinated seeds that were um, for their regions, but they weren't trying to be one size fits all industrial models. And so we all came together for uh, a, a two or three days. I remember that's where I met Kent Whaley and, and Rob Johnson from Johnny's was there. And you were certainly one of the prominent people, but just for the recording here, one of the things that I'll never forget is that it was a pretty heady conference. And we had uh, Jack Harlan, I think, was there, or some of the people that were involved in CIMIT in Mexico, you know, involved in what was now becoming a global recognition that we were losing plant, you know, agro, now they call it agro biodiversity. And, and uh, lots of lectures, lots of sitting in a big hall. And at the very end, I'll never forget, um, Forrest, um, uh, took the mic on the floor and invited everybody to get down out of their seats. In a sense, he was saying, get down out of your heads, where we've been for two or three days. We're talking about seeds, people. And got everybody, and was insistent until everybody got down on this big stage and he led us in a seed dance. We circled in two or three concentric circles, if I remember correctly. And it was really a touching and beautiful movement moment for me and if and i've always taken that um that inspiration with me um as i've gone forward that informed me as a seed person this isn't about thinking it through only there's lots of things you could do that we need to think about as we get in and go through this but we also have to get our hearts involved and our bodies and, and so i just want to thank you again for that incredible inspiration thank you yeah, where did that come from? What, you you had been doing somewhat of the same thing in your own organization? Uh, not so much in the uh, Abundant Life Seed Foundation, but in my larger life, uh, I was involved in um, spiritual dance um, for years and was a dance leader, still am a dance leader, and uh, usually leading other people's dances, but this Johnny Appleseed dance came to me. Uh, it was based on the musical uh, Johnny Appleseed that Disney orchestrated around 1950. There's a song in there, a lot of people know it because it's a song as a grace oftentimes. Oh, the Lord is good to me, and so I thank the Lord. You know that one? Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, I was. So that's what we did. And I, I have the tape of the uh, event, it somehow, somehow got to me afterwards. 
and you can hear these um, kind of middle America farm upper management people giggling and chuckling like I can't <laughs> believe I'm doing this you know yeah but they did it and uh, you know it's it's beyond thought uh, it it means it, it got into their bodies and for the rest of their lives if they're still alive or not you know there's some seed of unfoldment that was not part of their their thinking it wasn't part of their profession it was just right. part of the joy of seeds basically yeah yeah, we are, I'm thinking about it in real time here, but um, we've decided, or at least I have, and while I'm director, I think I, I have a little bit of say in the organization, although the, the staff does way more uh, important things than I do, but um, it's, we're proposing to abandon um, having conferences for the Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance. We've had two seed summits now uh, where we try to get everybody together, and they've both been... Um, well, largely city-based, you know, hotels. We did move to the um, American Indian, what's it called? Um, we did move to a different venue this last time, but I think we've decided that instead of that, what we really need is a festival, a seed festival more. And we were really lucky to have Pangioti come from Politi in Greece, where every year, every summer, they have a festival and all the seed keepers come together and they exchange a lot of uh, really detailed um, information about the seeds that they're all stewarding. And in fact, they claim now they're stewarding more seeds than the Greek National Seed Bank. Just in a network of people that come together once a year to sing and dance and eat really great food. So that's our inspiration. And so I want to invite you officially <laughs> to our first gathering. I accept. <laughs> yeah. With, and in fact, um, we've heard that um, Pangioti wants to fly to New York with um, sea keepers from Europe and uh, <clears throat> rent a bus and drive clear across the United States and start a caravan of people, teach workshops, sing music and dance on the way and bring them all to the, our festival will be in Southern Idaho. We have a location picked out. It'll be in October, not of this year, but the year following. And so yeah, it would be an honor to have you come and do the seed dance where it all started. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, yeah. That dance and or others perhaps too. Yeah, uh, oh, you're the master. You can choose the dance. Gotta keep evolving. Yeah, oh yeah, we're but always. I, I appreciate hearing the sound of, um, you know, celebrating rather than just uh, working away, which uh, at the end of your life, then you look back and say, well, I did work a lot. And what else? <laughs> yeah, you know, it's kind of else? like, I will, I will wear purple. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, do it in joy. Well, speaking of um, transitions and keeping up then and evolving, tell me about Inside Passage. You know, what was, you described a second ago about how you see that as even a more important role or mission in your life, but it still involves seeds. And so is that what happened? You, you decided that the wild seed part of Abundant Life, because I remember you guys were selling a number of wild seeds and herbs and medicinals and things like that. It wasn't just vegetables that were coming out of that. And so you just took that part of it and decided to make that your next journey? I would say I was called to that work. And here's how that happened. Uh, you're right. There was always a section of the seed catalog was listing wildflowers and trees and shrubs that were native to my bioregion, uh, the larger bioregion, which some people now call Cascadia, the local bioregion, which is often called Ish River, named after all the rivers that end in Ish, like <laughs> Suquamish, Snohomish, Samish, Stillaguamish, and so forth. Um, so the very, I, I guess the first year after seed sales had subsided, I thought, okay, what am I going to do the rest of the year now? I don't have the, uh, the food store anymore. And so I immediately started collecting seeds and just expanded uh, exponentially, even within a year or two. And that led to learning more plants, uh, just filling out my knowledge database of uh, what grows here um, and how do you collect it and how do you separate the seeds from the chaff and all of that, which was a pretty quick course because I had a good teacher, Lucy Hupp, to start with. And then that just kind of poked along for the next 15 years or so until this uh, board crisis came up and at that point, the 
regionally, uh, there had been two symposia, I think 1991 and 1992, or maybe I'm off by a year, where about 300 people gathered representing uh, nonprofit organizations, colleges, um, garden organizations, maybe park services. One was at, uh, I believe, at Evergreen in Olympia, Evergreen State College, uh, where my grandson now goes to school. And the other one was in uh, just outside of Portland, probably in Hillsborough, also at a community college. And we all shared notes. We had our elders who had been doing this work all their life and they were speaking. Um, and people got pretty fired up by that. And the next year, there was a, just an outbreak of nurseries, native plant nurseries. So what was happening was that people were thinking, how can I join in on this and make this real? Because there was no movement at that point. There were just reference books with plants in them and a few experts. But we were all kind of having this birthing moment together. And uh, one of the things that came out of that moment was a little magazine called Hortus West. Oh, I remember so, that. Some people would be familiar with Hortus, which is an enormous reference book of like all the species right. of plants. Uh, and uh, now it wouldn't be a book, it would be an online database. So somebody started a magazine once a year and it had a directory of nurseries and then species cross-referenced. So if you were looking for um, uh, Texas Brevifolia, you would just look under T and there would be one seed source and two nurseries and you could kind of go from there. And there were also a few good articles and some ads. And then that thing really did well. And so for the first year there were maybe 300 species listed in it. By the time they, they ceased publication, which was when uh, everybody had computers about 10 years later, um, I think they were up to like 1300 species. Wow. So that was the state of the art over those 10 years was that uh, we were able to resource within our regional community all this plant material and get it out circulating. So that just put you know wheels under the whole thing. And in those days, if people said, well, you know, I've got this open space, what should I plant? Well, let's say it was institutional, like around a, a business park or maybe a school outside the playground area. And I would suggest a couple things. And you know, within about 10 years, all those places were native landscaped. Wow. And that has just continued. It's like conventional wisdom now that the first thing you do is you think of what natives you could plant in these settings. I'm not saying that people don't still plant exotics, but um, that thought was not even in existence in 1992. Right. So I had to build that, that community of interest. And the thing that really ignited it was um, we have a small county airport, which is actually an international airport because it's right on the Canadian border, uh, which uh, was expanding that particular year. And in order to expand, they had to get money from the Federal Aviation Agency. And in order to do that, they had to basically clear cut about 150 acres of trees and mow everything down because the rules say there can't be any plants more than 15 feet tall on the flight path. So there was this basically a holocaust that winter of like all the landscape was completely ravaged and they were burning slash so there was smoke hanging over for weeks and people were very upset about it. Finally, I went to the um, port commission. And I said, you know, you've lost the public support. And I would just suggest if you want to get people back, you should plant some wildflowers there and make it beautiful. And they said, okay, here's a thousand dollars. See what you can do. Well, I couldn't do very much with it, but I made up a seed mix and they planted it and it bloomed spectacularly. <laughs> And wow. um, uh, at the point where I was having uh, the board crisis with Abundant Life, both local newspapers, one a weekly and one a daily, put out front page stories on the airport and how it had turned into a, quote, wildflower paradise. Oh, I love so it. So I thought, this is it. I'm, I'm going to go all in. And wow. uh, that's exactly when I started Abundant Life. And of course, about a week later, everybody had forgotten. Oh, yeah. the newspaper article. So it took about two or three years to um, get the floor in place so they could actually grow the business. Right. 
Yeah, I woke up one day when I started my little seed company, High Altitude Gardens. I think it took six or eight years into it. I was um, surprised when I looked that half my sales at that point were wildflower seeds and native grasses. And I got into this because of the vegetables, but I was being pulled. You know, I think it was that rising consciousness from the mid 80s through the mid 90s and and on where people were starting to wake up around that. So, wow, good timing though. Yeah. Yeah, I think it was, a, you know, I call that divine timing because you just step into a position that was created for you. Uh, and if you're willing, you know, you just say, I will, and you step forward and you do it rather than think, I'm doing this all out of my brain. I'm going to calculate and figure it out. And, you know, that's not what an artist does. No. Uh, no, MBAs do that. So do you teach um, young people or others um, some of your techniques? Do you ever do workshops on wild crafting seeds? Uh, I do, but not very often. There's not like a big demand for it. Right. Uh, plus, there's another generation coming up that's doing different kinds of garden workshops, and they have gradually included natives like we weren't doing 30 years ago. So it's kind of getting addressed in the larger community. Uh, the thing I'm doing right now uh, that kind of matches up with what you asked is um, we have a small native prairie here. Now they say when Vancouver sailed into the Straits in 1792 and he had the Archibald Menzies on board who was a master botanist uh, and his like fifth generation successor, Rob Mendes, is still around today, someone that I used to meet at different uh, events. Wow. Uh, Menzies saw this community oh, as wow. having hundreds of acres of prairie. He said it was like a parkland, it was, and they came in May, so you could just imagine. It's like right now, it's almost the exact anniversary, I think, May 7th of when they came. It was like May 7th or 8th, Wow. Uh, 228 years ago, and they walked into this spectacular bloom, which was basically because the native people here would burn the area about every five years to burn off the uh, incipient shrubbery and, and turn it back into an open prairie again. Uh, and that's, so we have maintained the remaining vestige, which is uh, less than an acre and a half. And I've been working on it for over 30 years as a volunteer. So what my method right now is basically remove that which is not native. Right. Uh, it's a lot of hand pulling, but it, it works and got most of the noxious weeds out of it. There's always more every year to do. And so now I've got a few people starting to get interested in helping with that. I will say that um, this generation that's succeeding me is not so much of a stoop labor hand pulling weeder. Um, <laughs> that's how you have to do it on a prairie unless you go in and just, you know, blast it with something poisonous, uh, which is, you know, anathema for me. So um, it's fortunate. Now I've got the prairie up to a level where it uh, doesn't take forever to hand weed it. And uh, this year there were some feature newspaper articles in the past few weeks, um, Native Plant Appreciation Month. And with everybody being, uh, you know, sequestered in their homes, they were just itching to get out and see something beautiful and actually mingle with people from a distance. Right. So every time I've been out there, uh, there have been a steady stream of people coming to look at the flowers, take pictures, ask questions. And out of that, I'm getting perhaps a few volunteers to help carry it on. Wow. Learning, yeah, I call this the great pause where we have a little bit more time to take care of ourselves and the world around us. And that's a really great example of that. Um, well, I'll, share, I'll share one more thing about that, which is yeah. uh, that, that remaining piece of prairie is what's called the rough at our local golf course. The, <laughs> only reason, the only reason it endured this long and didn't turn into more golf course was because there's some large boulders in this one and a half acre and they couldn't, uh, you know, make a fairway out of it. So they just left that. And uh, that's where all the natives were still in the soil. So then the Native Plant Society picked up on it and uh, about 35 years ago, and we got a formal agreement made that we were the stewards of that area. And then now it's getting famous. People are coming from a distance to look at it. 
Um, so, you know, groups come periodically. They'll come from places like Evergreen State College and community colleges. And um, the uh, land trust has uh, docent trainings there and so forth. Wow. I have, now, what can happen next is the golf course may fail because people are not golfing right now. <laughs> and the uh, contract is up this year. If the manager decides to let it go and nobody else steps up to run the golf course, we're suddenly looking at about 70 acres of potential restored prairie. Now, I don't know if that'll happen, but uh, we've been plugging for it now for about a year. And that would be, you know, the capstone on my career for sure to, you know, turn the landscape of Port Townsend back into what it was in 1792. Well, and having lawn or fairway is not a bad place to start, is it? We see volunteers come up that jumped out of the prairie and suddenly they're growing 50 feet away in some other cluster of shrubbery or something. And we know that nobody planted it. Uh, maybe voles are moving tubers. Maybe seeds are blowing 30 or 40 feet. But um, it's wow. pretty interesting to watch how it wants to expand. Wow. What a beautiful story. And this is, I keep thinking I have friends that are just depressed because of so much of America has uh, lawns. And I, you know, if you've um, been um, uh, into permaculture at all, you realize that uh, sheet mulching um, actually favors using, starting with something like a lawn where the soil structure is there and all you need is a light barrier and maybe some compost or other soils. And you can actually, it's, in the projects I was involved in, it's actually easier to get natives then to start mm -hmm. than almost in any other way. And and using herbicides or poisons is the worst way. They they seem to be the thing that invite in the noxious weeds. Exactly. You know? Yeah, it's an it's against my philosophy to use any kind of uh, biocides. You know, I'm I'm philosophically against that, but it's really practical too. They just yeah. don't work very well. If you have to pull things out to get them out of there. Absolutely. And I see there's a couple of questions coming up uh, from Bell and uh, Great. Yeah. Maybe and we start looking at that. I want to invite anyone else who has questions to uh, this is your chance. Um, I've, I got to ask uh, the most important ones I had. Again, I hope we get to spend more time at some point and I look forward to having you come to our festival. But yeah, um, is Jackie or someone, can you ask the questions? I don't see them coming up on my. Uh, Bell says, um, talk about the idea of quote, natives and how vigilant uh, certain groups can be to protect them even to the degree of chemical eradication of non-natives. Well, I can start uh, kind of at the end of that question by saying my previous call, which was about two hours ago, was with um, the uh, Institute for Applied Ecology in uh, Willamette Valley in Oregon. Uh, where they have crops. So they have 375 foot long rows of different native wildflowers. Sometimes the rows are mixed, so they'll have like, you know, 50 feet of one and 200 feet of another. But um, I believe they use a certain amount of uh, defoliant there to rid certain weeds that get in the way of their farming process. So when you jump from um, the uh, naturalness of the matrix of a prairie into the order of a farm, uh, that's where the kind of conflict of material starts to come in. The conflict between doing things laboriously uh, and doing things more industrially. And it was ironic that as he was explaining uh, what they were doing there, first of all, they use, uh, they, they cover the aisles with this fabric material so right. that they can actually uh, cut the plants into the aisle and the seed will start falling out and then they can just gather the fabric with the seeds on it and they don't have to do all the harvesting like I do a little bit at a time. Uh, there's a couple of downsides to that. One of them is if there's persistent wetness at the wrong time of year, the stuff could rot. Um, and uh, another one is it makes it more expedient to use um, glyphosate or something like that to uh, eliminate unwanted plants. And then the scale of it, you know, rows that are almost 400 feet long, uh, covering a number of acres. Uh, yeah, th there was a, a watchword that was given to me my very first year 
before I'd even really started my business, uh, I had lunch with um, this famous Zen master named Paul Reps. Uh, Zen flesh, Zen bones, if you ever right. come across Oh, yeah. That. Uh, it was just a, a wonderful thing that happened. A friend knew him quite well and said, why don't you come to lunch with us? And uh, he asked me what I was doing and I described it. I was on my first year and he said, quality congeals in quantity. So of course that stuck with me these entire almost 50 years, which means that when you try to scale up, there's a point reached where you start to lose some of the the best qualities of it if you don't um, maintain the scale. In other words, if you, if you can do it on one acre, if you do it on 10 acres, you might need 10 people to do it. Uh, yeah. However that equation works out, if you don't respect that, at some point you're gonna look for a shortcut and that's where nature begins to be uh, kind of abused. So yeah. That's, yeah, that's a nutshell. It looks like it's abused so far. Um, we'll see who bats last in that bigger yeah. story. Other thing to answer Bell's question, in the case of our prairie, which is, of course is only one of many places that I go in the course of a season, we have the support of the Native Plant Society for all these years. Actually, I was on the parks board when this issue came up in 1986. Uh, we drew up a contract, the city council ratified it, and then I retired from the parks board, which I was gonna do anyway. Uh, meanwhile, the Native Plant Society is now in its 34th year of uh, stewardship there and everybody knows it. So it's not like keep out because golf balls will come flying in once in a while. It's more like just respect the place. Um, don't trample it. Um, you know, don't uh, pick flowers for your vase that'll wilt tomorrow morning. Uh, and so with that amount of credibility, you know, allies like the Plant Society, which I'm of course a member of and the Land Trust, which I've been uh, also a board member at one time. Uh, these are the stewardship groups that can uh, get respect from the public. They can get funding from the public. They can get grants. They can put people out in the field who are on uh, salaried work. And that's how you sustain uh, and you know, keep it as a movement instead of just as a, like artifacts of an earlier period. Well, it sounds like having the place is really central to that. You have something to care for collectively. It strikes me that that's, it's your uh, modern version of your people's park where, where it all got started in Berkeley. Right, and we didn't have to, we didn't have to uh, go up against the National Guard. Um, <laughs> yeah. well, those are rough days. We just passed the 50th anniversary of Kent State, which was yes. a devastating time. There have been, you know, some uh, interferers, uh, name one, uh, the city engineer at the time we were first uh, contracted to, or, you know, agreed to keep this uh, prairie up, was not friendly to what we were doing. And uh, there was a time when they needed to bring in a water line. So he just kind of drew up his plan to draw the line straight through the prairie. And then they went in and dug a trench right through the prairie soil, which was, of course, the same soil been there for 3,000 years, oh my full God. of plant material. And they laid the water line. And then uh, what we had to do to recover that situation was we found a similar soil about a mile away, and we um, trucked it over and backfilled that trench with appropriate soil. And then we grew starts of three or four of the predominant matrix species and uh, put those plugs into the trench area. And now it's practically healed over. You can still see the faint outline of where the trench was, but after 30 years, it's pretty much blended in. So uh, there was no shortcut to that. Now you know it could take 30 years to recover a scar like that. And then if you go out into like, you know, an alpine zone of a national park, you could be talking a hundred years. Yeah, well, we. I grew up in the desert, high desert of um, central Idaho, 10 inches of rainfall. And there are instances that are more than 100 years old where the scars can still be seen. In the Mojave. And, yeah. Yeah. yeah it, long after. It's like well, if you have more moisture, it speeds up those cycles and maybe it can recover faster. But you go into drier areas and we're talking perm in our lifetimes or for generations, permanent damage. Mm -hmm. Just, Let me go to um, Jessica's question. Do you have any favorite books 
or resources. And so, yes, of course. Um, <laughs> uh, but, you know, as far as books, I mean, there's many references and um, mostly now I just start Googling things that I'm searching for and, uh, you know, the more specific, the better. Um, but the books that I use the most off the shelf are um, different uh, species lists and uh, wild plant identification books. So in my area, uh, we use what's called POJAR. That's one of the authors, POJAR and McKinnon, which is uh, uh, about a 500 page book with pretty useful pictures and uh, maps of the range of the different species and descriptions. And we often take that out into the field with us. Uh, so that's one. Then I have a little tiny book that's called, um, I think it's called Flora of the Olympic Peninsula, because that's exactly my nearest right. reference. And that was done by a wonderful woman that I was fortunate to know for a while named Nelsa Buckingham, who probably walked every trail and hillside on the entire peninsula. I might be exaggerating, but she knew where everything was. And she put together a species list for the entire peninsula. Uh, and as long as she lived, you could ask her, you know, Nelsa, where did you see this? And she would pretty much tell you where it was. Uh, what a dream if you're a seed collector. <laughs> yeah, but at, at, there wasn't much overlap there. She died in the 90s, so I was just uh, getting going on my serious collection. And then there's a certain amount of um, ownership, which is like you don't really want people out trampling around your precious places. So uh, we had a level of trust. You know, I would go visit her and, and right. she had... She had her uh, little herbarium that she would open up to people. So we still invoke Nelsa's name quite a lot around here. Wow. Uh, but mostly, I would say online resources at this point. Um, I'm, I'm doing that every day. I'll come across a species name I don't know. I'll just Google it, and it will say uh, ranges from the Yukon to Arizona, um, 3,000 foot elevation, uh, and so forth. And just like zero in on it until I know some more plants that way. Yeah. Um, do you use then plants.us.gov or whatever the USDA plants database? Does it take you there occasionally? Um, I use mostly Wikipedia. Oh, okay. Yeah, I've noticed that's gotten a lot better. Um, in, in my day, it was Hitchcock and Cronquist for the Pacific Northwest. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> this is the uh, second edition. It came out about a year ago. It wow. took something like four or five years to do a second edition. And if we weren't under uh, the restrictions we are, our, our chapter's speaker last month would have been the guy who was the lead editor on this book. Wow. And so uh, who was that? Uh, that was um, uh, David Giblin. Uh-huh. Yeah. Oh, it, yeah, it's nice to know what's updated. It's, yeah. it's a great book. I. I'm almost afraid to really get into it because it's like, you know, sacred. Like, do I dare even, I mean, I've got the older book and it's all, you know, worn out and falling apart, but um, uh, names have changed. That's, that's the tricky part. 40% of the Latin nomenclature yeah, is different now. Uh, uh, and I, I still cling to some of the old names because they just work better. Like, well, they're, they're you know, friends. Just, yeah. well, not just friends, but you know, uh, the one aster that I collect every year is aster subspicatus. Well, that rolls right off the tongue and it says aster, so you know what it is. Well, right. now it's called symphiotrichum uh, subspicatus, which took me a while to learn. And if I say that to someone, they'll say, uh, what, what is that, you know? Yeah. So I'm not sure, I'm, you know, the scientists are, there's splitters and there's lumpers. Yeah. Uh, so what, how would you characterize this new edition? Did they, are there, is it, are they splitting or are they lumping? <laughs> um, I think uh, the, the tendency is always more splitting, but then periodically they'll like completely reclassify things because of the ability now to explore right. the uh, DNA of the plants much more carefully. Right. And let's say, well, we used to have this in um, um, uh, cruciferae, but it turns out it's not, it's something else. And then they right. just, move it to a different part of the book. Wow. Yeah, so how much time do you spend out actually collecting, you know, would you say? Well, I like to go out in the late afternoon because that's when things are nice and dry. Um, you know, if you collect when, when there's dew or after a rain, you're gonna have a messy job. 
unless you're picking berries, in which case it doesn't matter so much. Uh, so you typically, um, late afternoon into the evening, sometimes until it's dark. Those are my collection times. Mm -hmm. I don't do it every day because I have a life, so I have to fit it in with, with my other activities and so forth. Um, and um, then as you get into the fall and the days get shorter and the moisture level comes up, it gets a little trickier. You have to really be much more uh, on top of it. And, uh, and so you, you have targets for how much you want to collect of certain species because of the business side of it. And, yeah. and I, I assume that changes every year then with what's available. Well, yeah, sometimes uh, I don't usually over collect because if I think I don't really need that much, then I'd rather leave it right where it is. Right. Uh, and, but a lot of things I wish I could collect more of, but then that requires seeing them in the wild at earlier stages, like when they're in bloom and keeping a, record of that and trying to get back. The tricky part is getting back. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So many places, I, I just frequent the same places every year because I know exactly when to show up. Uh, but of course, I always try to work in some new ones. And then there's some places I just go because I really love them. They're beautiful. And just to be there is a blessing. And if I'm lucky, I might get to collect some seeds. But if I'm not, then I was lucky to be there on a beautiful day and enjoy the mountains and the seaside and whatever. Are you seeing the times to show up change because of climate change, you think? Is, are things getting earlier? No, I wouldn't say, not, okay. not dramatically. There's just different years. Right. So um, we, we have quite a bit of variability here from one year to the next, uh, depending on what kind of a winter it's been. And then also what happens in early spring. And so for example, on the prairie, this is, this is fascinating to me. There are certain plants that are like harbingers. They come every year first, right. but then things will get scrambled after that. So like one year, maybe the camas will come before the um, larkspur, and then the next year it will re reverse. And that's because maybe there was a period of like five really nice days and everything started to really cook. And that brings on the flush of what would ordinarily be a later one, and it catches up with the earlier ones. Oh. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a dance and um, you know, I'm, I'm usually observing, but I can't be everywhere all the time. So I, I usually get to the places I need to get to before all the seed falls, but it's tricky. And then I have a, a like a network of independent contractors who are collecting for me. Right. Uh, typically I start them off on things that are, uh, can't be mistaken. Like well, let's say um, Oregon grape or black hawthorn or something like that. Uh, and I'll say, you know, I need 10 pounds of these berries and they'll go out and try to get that. And then I, I pay them and we do that over and over every year uh, until they know their spots really well. And then sometimes they'll show up with a, a penstemon and they'll say, do you know which penstemon this is? And I'll try <laughs> to figure it out. Right. Uh, rather than trust them to, you know, be good botanists, which you never know. Yeah. So that's kind of how we build up our, our variety. Sounds good. So um, there is a question here about um, your techniques for broadcasting seeds, wild seeds. Yeah, my technique, to start. my technique is, um, let's say I'm planting um, 10,000 square feet, a quarter acre, and maybe that requires uh, three or four pounds of a grass and wildflower mix. So I'll put them in a four gallon bucket mixed with some damp sand or some screen compost which acts as a tackifier. So it'd be like hydro seeding, except I'm walking the field instead of using a device. A machine, yeah. And then I'm just walking along and scattering the seed, you know, like right to left in front of me, uh, about 10 feet on either side. So I cover about 20 feet of a transect that I'm walking and reach the other side, turn, walk back, do it again, and try to make it come out to cover the whole area. That's, that's my basic sowing method. Uh, I used to, uh, draw a line in, in half or quarters and then get four buckets, say, and cover one quarter with one bucket. That way I wouldn't get to the end and run out of seed. I yeah, same thing, way. same yeah. thing. And uh, also I, I use about two parts, uh, let's say damp sand to one part seeds because it thins the seeds out so you don't um, suddenly realize, oh, I've already scattered all the seed and I'm only halfway through. So timing for that, do you, when is the best time to plant to do that in your area, time of the year? 
Well, there's two, there's two, two sowing times. One of them is in late summer, early fall. I usually use the indicator of um, uh, around Labor Day. There's usually the first, the first rain of the season. It's not a big rain. It's just sort of like a marker that says, okay, we're not really yeah. in summer anymore. Right, here it comes. And then maybe the, it might even be several weeks before we get another meaningful rain, but then I'll just watch as the morning dew starts to become stronger. And then it says, okay, if you, if you plant now, those seeds, if they start to germinate, they will be sustained. Uh, and the other time is um, March and April, while it's still pretty moist and the days are starting to lengthen and warm up. But since I collect almost entirely perennials, fall is the ideal time. It's just imitating nature where the seeds fall from the plant in uh, August or September, and then they germinate in September or October, and then they look after their own needs after that. Wow. So you're not, they don't need to be stratified, so to speak. They don't need to go through a whole, a whole cold winter before they germinate? Well, I think stratification is a, a sort of a construct that uh, nursery right. people came up with, but right. in the wild, uh, they won't all come up at once. So maybe some will come up the first month, some will come up three or four months later. Nature's kind of hedging her bets right. in case there's a like extended drought or maybe in my neighborhood would be deer coming through and eating everything to the ground. Right. Uh, so uh, instead of having all of her seeds come up at once, she has them come up uh, sequentially. A, a really good example would be lupin because lupin is a hard seed so uh, it takes a while for the seed coat to soften enough to germinate. And in doing germination tests, we find that maybe the first month 30% will germinate, maybe the next month another 20% will germinate and so forth with diminishing returns over a longer period. And then some will just stay dormant in the soil until maybe something dramatic happens like uh, soil disturbance and then they suddenly come up to the surface and they get their moment. Wow. Uh, so that's that's pretty much the uh, planting strategy. So is there anyone else do, um, um, collecting in your area, or, or is there competition for what you're doing now? Yeah, a little bit. I always think of it as more complementary than right. com competitive. Uh, um, I don't even know what all the other people are doing. Like uh, two or three of them, I'm pretty good friends with, and I. I've seen their lists and sometimes we exchange material like, you know, the guy up in Bellingham will say, I'm out of snowberry seed and I'll say, well, I still have some. So then I'll right. send him some and maybe I'll buy Indian plum from him the next year. Right. Uh, and then there's a couple who are, they don't put their cards on the table. So we don't know what they're doing. Uh, and I, they are the ones who are thinking competition. And I'm thinking, no, we're just all, we're all on the same team, but we don't always know that we're working together. We're just, you know, they're big job and uh, not that much coordination. So how much do you do on public lands then? Is there, I, I, I assume you, ha you do some on private land too, but. Oh yeah, yeah. I collect in primarily public places where it's legitimate. Mm -hmm. So uh, for example, I don't go into Olympic National Park for seed harvest. It's not legitimate. It's right. spelled out right there. Uh, then in the National Forest, uh, you know, incidental harvesting is permitted. So that's where things get a little bit, you know, softer boundaries and so forth. Um, and, you know, like city parks, there's no restrictions on that. And then there's roadsides where they don't spray and there's shorelines, which are usually pretty intact. And uh, so, you know, I just gotten to know my neighborhood over the last 40 years. Have the restrictions on national forest gotten do you have to get permission now or a permit or anything? I know they've done that in other areas. If you're collecting on a commercial scale, that would be like salal pickers here right. where people go out and cut brush. Right. So they're going to make an impact. Right. And uh, the state wants to know that or the National Forest Service wants to know that. And in some cases, I'll say, we're not going to let you do that. You know, like huckleberry harvest on traditional native sites. You can't just walk in there and, right. you know, intrude. Uh, so there's, they're just different conditions. And occasionally, um, I watch the legislature for any seed related legislation coming up. And there was some uh, legislation about the huckleberry harvest because uh, the tribes were complaining about these uh, mostly um, undocumented 
workers basically who were getting hired at the bottom of the pay scale and being right. sent out to you know pick all you can and they were shredding the plants because they don't have a relationship with them they didn't have a teacher they didn't have a tradition they're just like okay you get paid by the pound pick as many pounds as you can wow uh, so that was damaging but um the last legislation that happened uh, did not pass and i was instrumental in blocking it it was um driven by one large-scale grower in eastern washington which means they were probably growing like uh, wheat for planting over uh, forest fire scarred areas right. as a cover crop. And so they wanted certain things to be legislated in their favor. And it would have been draconian for small producers of diverse things like myself. So I just talked to my legislator who happened to be on the agriculture committee and he did not let it come out of the committee. Wow. So you fall in that space, you're incidental collection, small scale, dispersed, um, and not to a larger industrial commercial level where you would need regulation. I would say that's that we're still in a golden era, aren't we? <laughs> that yeah. Allows that. yeah, you know, the, the trend is always to legislate more and restrict more and that, that may happen during my time or after my time, who can say, uh, but, um, uh, you know, I expect it to get more restricted over time, but also I try to keep my relationships up with all the different agencies, the personnel. I know all my legislators at, okay. in the state house. Okay. Uh, uh, you know, I can talk to them. I could say this would be really punitive for small companies like ours. And they say, oh, we don't want to do that. Right. Uh, so as long as somebody has that awareness and a voice, that won't happen. Uh, but in a vacuum of, uh, let's say I'm retired and not really following it and somebody else is not following it like oh I never vote I'm not interested in that stuff well then one day they wake up and there's this form that came in the mail and says you have to fill out this form otherwise you can't do this work and you know that's that's the uh, devil take the hindmost kind of a situation yeah so do you still vegetable garden and save some of your own seeds uh would love to but uh we have deer oh and then uh, last year we had an, something else happen, which is called rabbits. Uh, and I just saw the most rabbits I've ever seen here last week, right in front of my house. They're just dancing around out there, chasing each other. And they'll come in and they'll like take entire pot potato plants out of the ground overnight and completely eat the roots. Not when the potatoes are ready, while they're in the middle of growing. And I thought, oh, there's no chance I'm gonna be able to grow anything in here. Wow. So, just so where, do you, go. where did you get your seeds? If you're going to vegetable garden, where do you get your seeds? Did you save some from the abundant life days or do you? I have almost no vegetable seeds left. Uh, there is a, one of my coworkers who was one of the last people I hired back in 92 or so, Tessa Gowans has a company called Seed Dreams, mm -hmm. which you probably haven't heard of because she doesn't market really outside of our area. Uh, but she's still doing the vegetable seeds with some of the same varieties and more that she's added in the 28 years that I have not wow. been doing vegetable seeds. So I was able to, you could say I handed it off. Yeah. Uh, and later on when Abundant Life stopped being a producer, she was still there doing that. And so we did not lose the whole package. Wow. What a dream to have that locally. I think that's our dream for the communities and valleys in the Rocky Mountain West is for everyone to be able to do that. And, and uh, do you, does that sound like that would be the culmination of your dream that you got started with, with Abundant Life, that everybody would have one? Um, yeah, I would break it down to um, watersheds probably. Mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, like if you study linguistics, it's fascinating that in New Guinea, Papua New Guinea, there are more languages spoken on that one island than there are in entire continents of, of this world. Uh, and that's because every watershed has its own unique population. Some of them don't even speak similar languages. They communicate by sign language traditionally. Right. You know, and those languages are very rapidly disappearing because of uh, modern media homogenizing everything. Uh, uh, so 
along with languages, you have the whole package of plants that people use, seeds that they save, and so forth. And so each watershed is unique. Uh, and that's why I mentioned Ish River at the beginning, because that is the what is now called the Salish Sea, uh, which is a wonderful creation that came out of disparate parts like Strait of Georgia, Puget Sound, Strait of Juan de Fuca, but there was no comprehensive name for this estuary. Now we have one. And so really I'm doing the seed work of the Salish Sea, uh, but a little bit larger. Wow. And I, I think you could, you could look all over the continent and you could say, oh, well, there's, there's a bioregion right there. And you know, Gary Nabhan has articulated that so well. Right. What he calls, I think, food provinces or something like, food nations. Food nations, yeah. Yeah, right. everybody should look up food nations online and they'll find he mapped North America by uh, what he calls like avocado nation. Salmon uh, nation, I think is what he called your area, yeah. Exactly, yeah. Wow. Well, I think we're going to wrap up. We're at six o'clock, um, six o'clock my time. Um, Should we um, maybe unmute for a moment and see if anybody has anything they want to just say out loud? Please. Yeah. Yeah. Particular inspiration or uh, last minute question or something. That'd be great. We're all here as a group and we've shared this space, but I just want to say, I really appreciated you coming on and I've, I'm learning again and uh, I look forward to seeing you uh, hopefully in Idaho in the fall of uh 2021 as soon anybody as want to say something 21 calendar i'll put it on the calendar <laughs> i'll make sure you get the dates looks like ml unmuted you got something to say no do you want to uh take us out with a little song <laughs> Um, I think more just, um, let's see, how can I best do this? Just kind of like a, a wish, you know, an intention. Okay. That um, we all become more skilled uh, in um, knowing our plants, knowing their virtues, um, uh, respecting the divinity of each one, even if it's not for something, it's just part of the part of the palette of uh, nature's work, and uh, even adopt a species perhaps that we don't use, that we don't eat or drink, but we just think it belongs here, it's intrinsic to this, this flora, and I'll make sure that it doesn't disappear from this flora. Wow. Well, if we all did that, we'd be Wow, I'm gonna, I'm going to, uh, I'm gonna do that. Well, thank you, Forrest. I think I'll wrap this up tonight for everybody. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, I've written to uh, Jeff McCormick, who started Southern Exposure Seed Exchange, um, to see if he will be our guest next week. I've been in contact with Gary Nabin. I think we'll have him at some point. And uh, Belle, do you, do you want to say something, or are you just saying goodbye? No, I was just saying goodbye. It was just such an honor to see Forrest and hear his stories and, and learn from him. And he's just been part of our household for a very long time. And it's, it's lovely to see everybody, all of our... Thanks for the opportunity. Students. Sounds yeah. like somebody's trying to reach me now, so I'll jump over to that. Okay. All right. Until Enjoy. next time. All right. Good night, everybody. All right. Good to see everybody. Hi, Joseph. Hi, Melissa. Hi, everybody. Danielle. police brutality